Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hi, everyone. Today I'm talking with Perry Martin, author of California Chrome, Our Story, a story about the champion racehorse, California Chrome. Before we get started, here's the inside scoop on Perry Martin. Perry Martin's career was in performing root cause failure analysis for the United States Air Force, performing aircraft mishap investigations, and then for the private sector involving failures in high reliability equipment. His first book was Electronic Failure Analysis Handbook, published by McGraw-Hill in 1999, and was a comprehensive overview of the use of root cause failure analysis in developing more reliable electronic equipment. California Chrome Our Story documents the development of a champion racehorse, and more enlightened readers will ascertain how root cause failure analysis was used in this process. For more information about Perry Martin and California Chrome, visit chromeourstory.com. Well, hi, Perry. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Hi, how are you? Good. Why don't you get us started by telling us a little bit about California Chrome, our story. What is it all about? Well, it's about our family's magnificent journey with that great horse, California Chrome. There's uh, a lot of information out on the Internet about California Chrome. And uh, my my late wife and I had been talking for a long time about putting our thoughts down on paper and publishing a book about it to, to sort of set the record straight and uh, clear things up about uh, what it takes to produce and manage uh, a champion racehorse. And uh, with her passing in June last year, I just had to sit down and start clearing up all the stuff that we had been planning to do together. And um, it just helped me to work through and, and get that <laughs> get that project done and get my feelings out there and, and uh, it just helped me heal. So yeah, it it was something we had been planning to do for a long time, and circumstances just dictated that I I get it done <laughs> right there and then. I am sorry to hear about your wife's passing. I imagine the book did the book take a little bit of a different spin than you had originally planned? Well, we had talked about it for a long time, and and my hope is uh, I was able to put at least a a good portion of Denise's insight into the book. Of course, the focus was was a little bit different because it's only one point of view, but I I feel comfortable with it that uh, her views are represented, and, and at least I did the best job I could. Yeah, yeah. So have horses always been an interest of yours, or how did you become interested in breeding? (laughs) Well, it sort of uh, happened organically, uh, as the book explains. I started out, when I got my first job when I was 16 years old, I worked in a grocery store, and I had never been to the horse races. My my parents didn't take me to the races, and it wasn't a part of, of my life at all. And then when I when I got my first job and then we started making a few new friends and one of the guys his father took him to the the races every weekend hmm. and I got invited along and I just sort of fell in love with it. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the sights, the sounds, the smells, the characters at the racetrack. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing and and so I, I went with him. Eventually, uh, I started driving myself out to the racetrack. Uh, it's not in the book, but but one time I actually drove into the Arlington Park parking lot and I parked my Jeep and um, there was a racehorse just wandering around out in the parking lot. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, and he was he, he was nibbling he was nibbling the grass that was growing up out of the cracks in the concrete. Okay. So I just sort of walked over. He he had a lead rope and I just picked up the rope and he followed me and I took him back over to the barn area. And uh, just started asking people, hey, anybody lose a horse? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a little surprised because I was able to walk into the barn area. I had no credentials or anything. 
and uh, I eventually found his owner and just handed him over. I was considering taking him home, but he wouldn't fit in a car. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's interesting to hear that you were 16 years old before you went to your first horse race. I grew up in Saratoga Springs. The first 15 years of my life, I lived in Saratoga Springs, New York, and I had never been to the races. Our family rented out our house each August when it was racing season, and so, you know, we were never around. We were camping with our grandparents, and um, I still have never been to a horse race. Still? Still, still. Well, so. hopefully hopefully we can get some people to read the book, and then we can change some of that. Yeah, yeah. So had I have you... never been to Saratoga, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> there are actually a few uh, venues, uh, Saratoga, Del Mar, uh, places like that, where they actually have uh, what we now in the industry call successful meets, <laughs> where, mm. where they're growing the sport and they get uh, increased viewership and purses are going up. And a lot of areas, racing is diminishing. Mm. There's a lot of competition mm. With other types of gambling, there's competition between other sports, other entertainment venues. But probably the main reason that racing is failing is because there's too many middlemen. Racing has not been organized the way, say, professional football or professional basketball or baseball is organized, Mm. where the owners control all the aspects and uh, all the revenues sort of flow towards the owner. Horse racing is a big pie, and it gets cut into a lot of pieces, and the pieces that go in the purses are getting smaller and smaller oh, wow. <laughs> over time and as we get more players. It's just a difficult situation. Yeah. There yeah. are ways to remedy that, but we could talk for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> You've got some ideas. And, huh? and I think uh, the, whole, the whole conversation would take on a different focus. <laughs> Well, how involved were you in the day-to-day operations? I know you were involved in the business side. What did that look like for you? Well, all the hands-on with the horse is basically done by the team that we put around him, the trainer. Uh, The trainer hires the groom and and, uh, the hot walkers and the exercise riders. Mm -hmm. That's all the trainer's business. I'm a little more hands-on because... I'm a business owner. When I have a business, if you're going to be successful in a business, you have to take a very active part in it. And I took a very active part in the management of California Chrome. Mm -hmm. Uh, That seemed to generate a lot of resentment in the industry because, you know, it's a sport of kings. And so it's supposed to be wealthy people that uh, will all hire a trainer and I'll just delegate everything to him and sort of take a hands-off approach. Well, to me, it sounds like your involvement had a lot to do with California Chrome becoming a champion racehorse. Can you tell us about uh, some of the highlights that led to his championship standing in the horse racing world? It's kind of interesting because with California Chrome, you know, we've got the Chromies. Mm -hmm. Chromies are fans of California Chrome, and and Chromies are all over the board. (laughs) (laughs) When it comes to um, you know their experience with racing or, or uh, involvement with racing, understanding of racing and how things are done, a lot of the Chromies are, were a lot of fun to interact with. Some of them were just hypersensitive. You know, Chrome was their hero, and and he's America's horse, and you can't send America's horse to Dubai because. Dubai is not America. Mm. Chrome is America's horse, and he belongs in America. And then they, you know, you put the horse in a um, a, a portable stall and load it onto the back of a 747, and you fly them over to Dubai. And then we got all this <laughs> complaining that, oh, he's America's hero, and, and you're putting him into a tin can. <laughs> and and flying him across the ocean, and the poor horse is suffering. And we had to put up with a lot of uh, different opinions from ours. It, it's just amazing how people could just wedge themselves in there and uh, try and tell other people how to run their business or run their horse operation or how they should treat horses or anything else. It was a uh, an experience. 
So <laughs> it, was, it was an experience. <laughs> and that was part of the reason we, again, we wrote the book because there's all this stuff out there. And we just, I'm just trying to put it down. Well, this is what we're doing. And this is why we did it. And if you don't agree with it, that's fine. You know, you go out and you show me. You do it yourself and <laughs> right. show me how you can do it so much better than me. <laughs> because, and I will stand back and just applaud. <laughs> yeah. So did you have chromies that followed you from race to race? That oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. We, um, in fact, it was amazing. We went, the first time we went to Dubai and we got off the plane and we're in the airport and we're waiting at customs. I knew more people. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned this to Denise, you know, I know more people here in, in Dubai than I knew in the Los Angeles airport where we departed from. How funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. There were so many people. I saw the media people from horse racing that I knew. I saw all kinds of jockeys that I knew. The cronies were there, other trainers, other owners. It was something that struck me as so just odd that yeah. here I am over in Dubai, and, and I, there's more people here that I know than <laughs> in America. That's crazy. So, That's kind of surreal. I mean, yeah. 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 So now tell us a little bit about uh, California Chrome. I understand he was quite charismatic. What are some of his most distinguishing traits? The most important thing, he's a very, very intelligent horse. I was expecting him to talk, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like Mr. Ed. Yeah, yeah. And he likes people. He likes to make people happy, oh. and he will learn things that make people happy. Like when he hears cameras clicking, he will turn towards the cameras, and he really hams it up. <laughs> you know, he'll open his nostrils really wide, and he'll open his mouth and, and give a, a whinny. And uh, that's one of the things that really connected Chrome to people. All the other horses were all business. You know, they're coming out of the chute there, being let out onto the track. And uh, the people along the fence, they would they would yell chrome, and he would stop, and he'd turn, and he'd look, he'd look <laughs> at them, just right there, right in the eye. And, and the people just, you know, they, they were amazed yeah. how smart he was and everything. So he didn't do things by the book either. <laughs> no. I know when we, we took him to England, uh, Denise and I finally, uh, two weeks after he had been there, we showed up, and... Um, England was just a totally different experience for him. You know, he was used to, in America, and they have uh, small 8 by 12 foot stalls mm -hmm. and spend his most of his day in the barn there, and, and then it's out onto the track and then back into the stall. Mm -hmm. And in England, they have uh, what are called gallops for training the horses in Newmarket. And the gallops at Newmarket are just beautiful. It's just rolling hills, rolling green hills for as far as you can see. You can't see a building out there. Hmm. And Chrome would walk from the yard out to the gallops. It's about a 45-minute walk. He would have his rider on his back, and they'd, they'd go on the, the walking trails. And then he'd walk out onto the gallops. And I saw him stand there for 10 minutes. <laughs> he was amazed. What is this? He just scanned from left to right and then back, just green hills as far as he could see. Oh, wow. And, and he'd never seen anything like that before. And you could just see him. <laughs> I could almost hear him thinking, you know, wow, what is this? This is great. Yeah. And then, then seeing him running across those gallops, it was just gorgeous. Oh, I'll bet. Like a kid seeing something for the first time. Yeah, it was. I sort of experienced it through his eyes. Mm. And it's a type of a workout that you really don't get very often here in America because, like I said, they're rolling green hills, and you're running uphill and running downhill, and uh, it works different muscles than uh, running on a flat track all the time. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so it helped to develop a lot of the support muscles in his hind end. I think that's why he did so well in 2016. Hmm. It's because of some of the hill work he did in England. Where is California Chrome now? He's in Hokkaido, Japan, at uh, Aero Stud. We uh, retired Chrome to Stud at uh, Taylor Made Farm in Lexington, Kentucky, first. And uh, he spent three years there. Uh, he also had two years he shuttled down to Chile 
But uh, we were getting good to high quality mare to chrome in his North American breeding career, but we weren't getting the best mares and competition was fierce. And at the sales, we weren't getting big numbers at the sales like we were hoping. Mm -hmm. But at the sales, we noticed that the people purchasing some of the highest uh, priced uh, yearlings that were being sold were being sold to Japanese uh, interest. Mm. And when we got a call from Aero Stud, and we got a very significant offer uh, for Chrome, and um, our initial response was, uh, that's very generous, thank you, but no. Mm-hmm. And they called back, and they said, uh, well, what would it take in order to do this? And so I gave them a list of everything it would take. And then uh, when they called back and offered everything we wanted, <laughs> Wow. It's hard to say no when you're when you're offered everything you asked for. Yeah. So we we said yes, and Chrome went to Japan, which I think in his uh, stallion career is going to be a good thing. Okay. In America, you know, horse racing is the sport of kings. In Japan, horse racing is the king of sports. Mm. The racing public there it grows every year. It's a country that's much smaller than the United States. Mm-hmm. However, they wager four times more in Japan on horse racing than we do in the entirety of the United States. Wow. Four times more. And so their purses are much, much higher. Yeah. And uh, the purses for racing, they have a model similar to ours where the purses come from a portion of, from wagering. And so their purses are much higher. And for that reason, if you look at a list of the the world ranking of stallions by progeny earnings, eight of the top 10 stallions are based in Japan. Oh, wow. So we felt, because we're chromies to the max, we, <laughs> we're really interested in his career. Right. And so we wanted him to be placed in that environment where he could excel. And our hope is that he'll get higher quality mares there than he was getting in the U.S. And they will show results on the racetrack and he will grow into the top 10 list very easily and quickly. Mm. So are you still involved or have you kind of stepped back now? We uh, Part of what we asked for was five lifetime breeding rights. So I have five mares. Well, we are, I am now breeding in Japan. <laughs> And I have five mares in Japan that I breed the chrome every year. So do you spend time in Japan? I have not been there yet. Okay. Um, we actually had tickets, and uh, COVID canceled all the travel. Right, right. In fact, we had the truck loaded. We were going to the airport, and I got a text on my phone before we pulled out of the driveway from the airline saying that uh, they were canceling the flight because of COVID. We just put the car in park, turned it off, unloaded the bags, and oh, no. uh, we never did get to go. Yeah. It's starting to loosen up, and I'll, I'll eventually make a trip over there. Now, I noticed there have been a couple of other books published about California Chrome. What are your thoughts on how California Chrome is represented in these books? Well, I've gone on Amazon, and I've clicked on the look inside, mm. and I've read the whatever tidbits they give. And my impression is uh, California Chrome has an extensive Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. I think there's more information there. Uh, a lot of it is wrong, but uh, there's there's all kinds of stuff in there that's, that's wrong. But I was never interviewed for any of those books, so I don't know where they get their information from. That's crazy. Yeah, I just, I wondered about that. And I guess you can just write a book about anything. Well, <laughs> yeah. You can go on Wikipedia, and they have a book feature now. You can click Make a Book, and it'll take all the Wikipedia stuff and reformat it and, and uh, actually print you a little book, and then you can go through and rework some of it and just publish it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it just doesn't seem right. I think that's what's happening. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. sounds like it. Hmm. But in horse racing, the media is, uh, they like to apply classical stories to horse racing. For instance, Seabiscuit. Mm -hmm. you know, they made a movie, Seabiscuit, and it's all about leading up to the match race between uh, Seabiscuit and War Admiral. And they decide to frame it in terms of David and Goliath, because that's a classical story. That's a winner. Everybody knows about that. So they put Seabiscuit 
as David, a diminutive little <laughs> <laughs> little underdog, and and War Admiral as a giant. In the, they had him, you know, seventeen or eighteen hands, whatever they were talking about in the movie. And and I'm sort of Mr. Reality, and and I know that that Sea Biscuit and War Admiral were actually they had very very similar pedigrees, for one thing, and they were very similar in size. In fact, Sea Biscuit was a little bit larger than War Admiral when measured, you know, height at the withers, which mm-hmm. is how you measure height for a horse. So they just made it up. <laughs> Sensationalism. In order to, to, to frame the, yeah, there's there's so much wrong with that that uh, Sea Biscuit movie. Yeah. I go through as a, every time I watch it, I just oh nope, that's not right, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they have artistic license. Right. Isn't that what you call it? Yeah, that's what you call it. Yeah. <laughs> Now, your career, first in the United States Air Force and then in the private sector, was performing root cause failure analysis. And you mentioned that readers might ascertain how this process was used to develop a champion racehorse. Can you tell us a little bit about that, maybe in layman's terms? Well, yeah. Failure analysis is, uh, well, you look at failures to see what it is that was done wrong so that you can make corrections and do things better the Mm -hmm. next time. And that's a, a very simple process that you can use on, on pretty much anything, applying it to racehorses. If we do something wrong that causes a problem, for instance, when we were making the trip to Dubai, there was all this speculation in the media about uh, in Dubai, they don't allow Lasix, which is an anti-bleeder medication mm-hmm. uh, given to horses. And and so they were worried. They were saying, well, we're making the wrong decision going there because there's a possibility he could bleed and hurt himself. And um, so I explained in the book how Chrome, his first two races, we didn't use Lasix. After every workout and after every race, the horse gets scoped and and they look for bleeding. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and, uh, we never found that on Chrome. We ran Chrome in a race and he did not perform well. And we scoped him after the race, and we found out that uh, we were racing in Los Angeles. And the air quality in Los Angeles is less than optimal. Right, right. <laughs> There's a lot of smog there. And, and at this particular time of year, there was also a lot of uh, fires up in the, in the forest of California, and the smoke was blowing into the valley. And uh, so the air pollution was, was really, really bad. And the, uh, the pollution was irritating chrome sinuses. And so they were red and irritated, and he was forming a lot of mucus mm-hmm. in his nasal passages. Horses only breathe through their nasal passages, and so the buildup of mucus in there was causing him to have difficulty breathing uh, when he was running. And if you can't uh, breathe when you're running, you don't perform well. <laughs> right. So we were able to explain why Chrome had a bad race. The veterinarian recommended that we start him on Lasix, which is a diuretic. And so if we do pre-race Lasix, the diuretic will cause him to uh, dehydrate a little bit. So it pulls all the water out of his system. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have water in your system, you can't form mucus. And if you don't have mucus, then that doesn't interrupt his uh, breathing. And so we started him on Lasix. So that's a lesson we learned, and then we never had that problem again, and he performed better. So there's a whole bunch of those little learned lessons. Yeah. So what are people saying about California Chrome, our story? Are you getting some feedback? Uh, Most of it is uh, very good. I'm very happy with the feedback. I mean, the people I talk to the most are my neighbors. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And they seem to like it. The complaints that I get are uh, basically on the background stuff. When I put I put the the background in there, I'm a scientist, and so I've got some science in there. Mm. Uh, I've got the the stuff I enjoy: science, the breeding of the horse, and pedigree analysis is not for everybody. <laughs> um, I try and keep that stuff short. Um, I think it's important to have background about myself and about the family. In order to show, you know, where we came from and how we got there and why we were doing the things we were doing, 
Right. So I put that background in there because I think it's important. But also, I mean, when I did that, I understood that this is a story about racing. Uh, it should be a fast read. It should have a certain tempo, like a horse race. So I keep that information relatively short. I mean, our entire lives, our background, where we came from, is in the first 40 pages. And okay. it's a 267-page book. So it's not a really big portion, uh, and I do mix up the early part with some stories about horse racing and stuff. So yeah. like I said, I try and make it go quickly, and so hopefully that will fade into the background and sort of add to the context, you know, the overall picture, sort of like the background in, in Newmarket with the green rolling hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you're focused on chrome running across those green rolling hills, but it's nice to have the hills there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. frame everything in. Yeah, I could picture that actually when you were talking about that. So yeah, I put a lot into the book. I mean, my sort of my artsy side comes out. Everything from the front cover and back. I mean, literally the bookends, the front cover and the back cover. Yeah. My doctor took the picture on the front cover. He's just an amateur photographer. Oh. He got just a, a beautiful picture of Chrome in the winter circle at the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. He gave me permission to use that. Uh, and then on the back cover, I have a guy that's won over 400 awards for photography. I mean, the Pulitzer Prize. He was employed by National Geographic, taking pictures of the world for 30 years. He was employed by the Breeders' Cup and uh, KentuckyDerby.com to take pictures, their official photographer. So that's on the back cover. So I've got a, an amateur on the front cover, a <laughs> pro on the back cover. And then in the middle, I put about, uh, I think there's actually nine. Jenny Doyle took the pictures I put in the middle of the book of Chrome. Uh, like we call it a magical day in September. Oh, nice. Where the sun was just hitting his coat just the perfect way, and we got some beautiful pictures of Chrome. So, yeah. Are those pictures on your website? I saw some really nice pictures on your website as yes. well. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I use the same pictures on the website. Oh, wow. Yeah, those are mm-hmm. beautiful. So now I know you've written a couple of books. Do you have any plans to write any more? Well, the first book I wrote took three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Electronic Failure Analysis Handbook. Of course, it's 600 pages. Oh, wow. (laughs) And sold for over 100 bucks. But uh, didn't make any money off of it. But didn't really write it to make money. What it did do was it it helped me with my career uh, to become established as an expert Uh, I made a lot more money uh, teaching seminars and handing out the books at the seminars. Oh, right. Yeah. uh, Than I did writing the book. So that was uh, that was a a labor of love. And then uh, this book only took five months to write. So we're going in the right direction. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It's it's yet to be determined if I'll make any money. But uh, that's really wasn't my goal anyway. So it doesn't. It doesn't matter. So maybe the next book will only take a month to write. There you go. And uh, and if, if it becomes that easy, then you know, might as well do one every month. <laughs> <laughs> well, Perry, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing a little bit with us about yourself and your work. Well, thank you. It was fun. Thank you for joining me today for my interview with Perry Martin, author of California Chrome, Our Story. To learn more about Perry Martin, visit his website at chromerstory.com. And be sure to check out our other interviews at InsideScoopLive.com.